This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The Lighting Source, major line distributor of commercial and industrial lighting, including hard-to-find bulbs and fixtures, as well as a broad range of LED products. With 35 years' experience servicing lighting needs, The Lighting Source proudly sponsors Sports Files. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Today on Sports Files, we'll preview the 2014 college football season, which kicks off tonight and do so with an entertaining panel of local media members. The time is here. The college pigskin season kicks off with a bang tonight. Among the games, Ole Miss faces Boise State in Atlanta, and South Carolina hosts Texas A&M in an opening night SEC Top 25 clash. The first weekend includes other big showdowns such as LSU versus Wisconsin, Alabama and West Virginia, Clemson and Georgia, Florida State meets Oklahoma State, and Miami versus ACC newcomer Louisville. Today on Sports Files, we'll take a look at the season with an emphasis on the SEC and the prospects for the Memphis Tigers in the American. And joining me in the discussion is Rob Fisher from Real Sports Talk, Sports 56 and 87.7 FM, Fox 13 Television Sports Director Matt Stark, and WMC Action News 5 Sports Reporter and Anchor Ari Alexander. It's all next on Sports Files. Well, guys, thanks so much for joining me today. Appreciate it. Good to see you, Matt. Good to be here. Rob. Pleasure. Ari, thanks so yeah. much for joining us. All right, let's begin with the Memphis Tigers. Last year, in some regards, they were better than the year prior, but in the win total, they were not. They were three as opposed to four, so they dropped down uh, in the Ws. What are the expectations? What should the expectations be for this coming, this upcoming season? It's the third year now for Justin Fuente. Let me start with you, Matt. I'll tell you what, the, the, the non-conference schedule didn't do them any favors, and it's the third year of the Fuente era, right? You've got Ole Miss. That's going to be a tough game down in Oxford, okay? To travel to UCLA, they need that game like they need a hole in the head, okay? <laughs> because then you worry about potential. UCLA, I've got in my final four. I mean, a lot of people think they're going to be one of the best teams in the nation. Right. They don't need that game. They need to start stacking some wins. The early portion of the schedule is going to be trouble because there's been the talk about this is, you know, wait till this year, right? Well, it, very likely they're going to open up two and four. Then you've got to start stringing some wins together to get to that magical six to get to a bowl game. So that's where I see them falling. They need some things to go their way. They need Paxton Lynch to step up. They need the offensive line to be a lot better than they were a year ago. But I don't think the schedule did them any favors, particularly that trip to California. Well, you're right with the non-conference. But as far as the conference schedule is concerned, Fish, they avoid UCF. Of course, Louisville is out of the conference. They have winnable games. So with that said and with what Matt said about the expectations. What do you think the expectations should be? I love the schedule. I love playing UCLA. I love that they're playing Ole Miss. I love it because they're returning those games, mm -hmm. and it'll be great for the future and the schedule at home at the Liberty Bowl. I think the schedule is favorable. Last year, I think we went into the season with optimism, really with no expectation. And I think we go in this season with optimism with expectation. It's year three. You have players now, systems in place. You went through growing pains of a freshman quarterback throughout the year last year and very stubborn about it, not making a change. We'll see how much he's grown. Did he grow more than just experience? And we'll find out. Worst case scenario, if Paxton Lynch isn't the starting quarterback by the end of the year, you got problems. Mm -hmm. If he is, I think things are right. And you mentioned the conference schedule. You play every team that's behind you that the media picked. You play every team that's behind you, a couple of those games at home. You play the team that's picked right ahead of you as well. To me, expectation, I don't know which ones I can pick out, but I'm saying they, six wins. I mean, two years ago was good. They finished well for a team that had nothing to play for. Last year started well, finished poorly, put it together, year three. I, I think six wins should be the expectation. Or if they are to get the six and bowl eligible, obviously they're going to have to recover quickly from that early season gauntlet that Matt talked about, and they're going to have to 
uh, not allow that to affect them. We saw last year when they lost a couple of close games that they could have beaten against better opponents. And then at the end of the year, they just completely fell apart. So how do they avoid getting into that situation after the tough start? Because we know they're going to have problems in U at UCLA. I would assume they're going to have problems in Oxford. How can they bounce back from that and, and go ahead and win us? six games like Fish thinks they will. I'm not necessarily sure it's, it's about bouncing back. Last year, all the close games did not go Memphis's way, and that was the issue. So by the end of the year, your defense has been playing really well all season, and Memphis returns most of that defense this year. Something just needs to happen towards Memphis to go right in one of those games where they're close, where it's a one, two possession game, where Ifedi and uh, McCain, those guys are keeping them in it. That was the problem last year. Those guys worked so hard to keep the team in the game and then they lose in the last drive. And then the next week, the same thing happens. Then you get towards the end of the year, we had uh, Coach Fuente say the other day, they just kind of lost hold of the rope. And that's what happens. You, you play six, seven games where you're right there at the end and then you lose and then towards the end of the year, you just kind of feel like nothing's going your way. Against a team like UCLA against Ole Miss, that's not quite as bad. But early in the year, no one thought UCF was going to be as good as they were going to be. No one thought Cincinnati was going to challenge for the conference. And so losing those games that were incredibly winnable, I think really frustrated Memphis towards the end of the year. I think I agree with Fish. Six wins should be the expectation. That's pretty much what I've heard from fans. They want six and six in a bowl game. All right, Paxton Lynch gets to start the whole entire year last year. Even when he struggled, they never went with Karam. He stuck with Lynch. Now he's got a second full year under the belt. If he struggles, should he be quick to pull the trigger and bring in another quarterback if it's not working four or five games into the season? I don't know that we know enough about the backups that you're going to make that decision yet. This is the one area where I kind of yield to Coach Fuente as a former standout quarterback, right? If he doesn't know his quarterbacks and about who's the best quarterback to lead this team, then I don't know what's going on over there, right, right? So I tend to have faith in him that he's going to put the best guy out there. And I think that was what he did last year, even though people were clamoring. All right, Jacob Karam had carried some wins against some bad teams at the end of the prior season, but he stuck with Paxton because I think that he knows – and I think that most of us I would agree that Paxton was the better player, better arm. I think it all came down to the offensive line. We watched every single game last year. They didn't have time to run. They didn't have time to throw. It's hard no matter who you have under center if you can't protect your quarterback. That's the biggest key. And I think if the line plays better, I think you'll see better things from Paxton. If the line can't step up, then we're kind of right where we were a year ago. If we continue to be where we were a year ago, and let's say they only win three games, is Fuente on the hot seat after his third year? No. Uh, you, you, can't, you, you can't keep revolving the door. Um, you, you have to go forward. But then I think he has to question himself. You know, did I make the right decision at quarterback? Um, am I getting the right players? Do I have the right mix of players? I don't expect that to happen. I, I think he's a, a really good coach. I think Ari brought up a great point about learning how to win games and, and finish games. You know, pulling Paxton after five, six games, heck, the way the schedule is, those first five, six games are very difficult. I, I think you stick right. with them. And then after right. that, hopefully those experiences of those tough losses. You look at the number of games last year, they were either leading, tied, or had the ball with the chance to tie or take the lead in the fourth quarter. So you know, hopefully those experiences come through this year with the entire team, including the quarterback. And being tested early hopefully gets you battle-tested for the second half of the, the season. So... I, I don't see a scenario of three wins. If it happens, maybe have to reevaluate what you're doing going forward. Maybe have to reevaluate the quarterback position. But I, I'd, I'd be stunned if that were the case this year. All right, let's switch gears. Let's talk about the SEC. Last year, two major <coughs> surprises. Nobody picked Auburn at the beginning of the season. Nobody picked Missouri. Ari, is there a surprise team this year? I don't think there's a surprise team, but there's a couple teams that are, that are media darlings that I think – could be a little better than people think they will be. Mississippi teams, Mississippi and Mississippi State, both could be very good. This is one of the very weird years in the SEC where almost no one returns a quarterback. Last year, he had some of the best quarterback play ever in the conference. Aaron Murray, A.J. McCarron, Johnny Football. All those guys were incredible, all gone now. So you have Dak Prescott, who people love. He's even a Heisman contender right now that people are talking about. Dark based, horse, yes. Dark horse, based on six games. And then you have Bo Wallace, who's healthy with that shoulder injury. He went and had USC's pitching coach, former pitching coach look at him and fix him all up talk to coach Hugh Freeze this week and he said he looks better than he's ever seen Bo Wallace so I think the Mississippi teams could be 
challengers in the West because you don't know what's what's happening with LSU. They have two quarterbacks that are battling for a spot. Alabama is going to be great again, but you don't know who their quarterback is. And Auburn uh, is a team that loses a few players. They don't know if they can replace Trey Mason. Matt, there is excitement in Oxford, but how does Ole Miss, with the plethora of talent they have, become one of the upper echelon teams of the conference and of, of that division? That's the mm -hmm. best division in football in the best conference. But are they... Alabama, LSU, Auburn, talent-wise, can they be there? That's a great question. I think the biggest key for them is, in addition to keeping Bo Wallace healthy, because we've seen what Hugh Freeze does with the offenses, right? They're going to score points. We know that. they got talent everywhere. It's defensively, all right? Can they become a physical enough defense in the SEC? The guy that I really like and that a lot of people have talked about, obviously, is Robert Kimdichie in the breakout year that they're expecting him to have. We were down there for media day. He, you, he, you were there as well. He radiated this intensity in sports spoke of this passion of what he learned from his freshman year going forward, making the leap from high school to an impact player in the league, and now taking that next step, learning about defense, his learning and his teammates talked about how he's got to go all out on every single play and learn from that. So that, I think, is the biggest key for me for Ole Miss because I think they're still going to be able to score points. It comes down to can they stop teams from scoring points. Fish, already brought up the quarterback situation in the league at LSU at Alabama. We go into the season not knowing who the starting quarterback is. This may be silly, but should there be concern from Bama and LSU faithful that they don't have a number one, a pure number one going into the first weekend of the season? I think there is concern. Should there be? I don't know. I, I have I have faith that Nick Saban will pick the right guy, uh, and they'll both get an That's a pretty good track record. <laughs> pretty good track. Lane Kiffin's got a pretty good track record with quarterbacks, with quarterbacks too. Right. I mean, let's remember Jonathan Crompton got drafted. Um, so I, I think they'll be okay. LSU's the one that, that concerns me more because they're young quarterbacks. And, you know, but with their offensive coordinator now, with uh, Cam Cameron, you know, maybe he can develop a guy. Zach Mettenberger threw the ball a lot more last year than we thought he would. Uh, so maybe it shouldn't be overly concerned, but they're both so talented everywhere else that I don't think it's concerned. And, and let's remember, with all the new quarterbacks that, that you talked about, Ari, it, it's true, but look at Cam Newton came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Johnny Manziel came out of nowhere. Nick Marshall really came out of nowhere. I mean, you look at his numbers at junior college, what he did last year was phenomenal. Somebody's going to come out of nowhere this year. You're going to have a quarterback or two because of numbers. You're going to have a quarterback or two that are going to be dynamite, and we'll see them on the All-SEC 1, 2, or 3 team at the end of the year. I think the stat is, and this is just, I'm going by memory, that five of the last seven winning quarterbacks in the BCS championship game, it was their first year. So it, it kind of plays into what you're talking about. And a couple of these guys have been in the system for a while, so they know it going in, and, and I think that helps. We saw Georgia when David Green was replaced, and D.J. Shockley came in and won the SEC championship. Who's to say Hudson Mason can't do the same? All right, Tennessee's in, in a similar situation to Memphis where we think they might be able to get the six. I think people would probably be satisfied with five. I know Tiger fans would be, maybe not Vols fans, but how much improvement do we see from Butch Jones in year two with the Vols? I think the same thing happens uh, with the Vols that happens throughout the uh, rest of the SEC. You know who your quarterback is, and then everything's fine. They're going to start uh, Justin Worley. But you don't know how good Justin Worley can be. He struggled against the SEC, and so did the rest of their quarterbacks. The, Tennessee just doesn't quite have the depth that some of those teams yet, but they're very lucky that they're not in the SEC West because you have Vanderbilt in the East who just lost their coach you have, and their quarterback, and you have Missouri who lost almost everyone. That whole defense except for Marcus Golden is gone. That's a potentially winnable game against a team who doesn't really know their defensive identity yet. And then you have Kentucky in the league, who's one of the weaker teams. So Tennessee has a chance to get steal a win, get a couple more. I think if they, they play well enough non-conference, they could sneak six and then maybe get some potential uh, momentum going for the program. Going into last season, Pinkle's name popped up, Mullen's name popped up as potential coaches on the hot seat, the proverbial hot seat. Is there a coach this year on the hot seat? I in the SEC? You'd, you'd have to go with Muschamp probably at Florida. Mm, okay. I mean, obviously, the Gators aren't used to losing, and they have not played up Good to point. expectations the last couple of years. So off the top of my head, that's the one I would come up with. And other than that, I guess that – Everybody else pretty Rick, safe. Uh, everybody always likes to say Rick, but, I mean, the guy <laughs> just cranks out wins. They, they, granted, they haven't gone hey, past, you know – Muschamp for sure. Yeah. I mean, they got to win eight. Um, Mark Richt could be on the hot seat as of Saturday. 
Yeah, good point. Have you, I mean, have you ever seen every, and then go eleven and one? Right. Um, have you ever seen a team with more off the field distractions, players being kicked off the team or suspended for whatever the case may be, than with Georgia every year? Every year, and you know, I guess their hope because of all the players that have, are gone now defensively from a average to poor defense a year ago. Uh, new def- defensive coordinator Jeremy Pruitt did amazing things at Florida State, and they're hoping for the same sorts of things uh, at Georgia. And, uh, Georgia's another one of those teams. They got the, all the talent. But it's just got to translate on the field. And maybe with Jeremy Pruitt, that can happen. Um, you know, Mark Richt, uh, it's Clemson, South Carolina. First two games determine whether or not fans think he can win it all or not. He's won a lot yeah. of games to be on the hot seat every yeah. single year. You're but it right. seems to happen, and they seem to slip up in one of those two. But um, Clemson's at home. Clemson's down a little bit. South Carolina is on the road, and that's a huge game in the second game of the year. All right, what do you think about the statement that Nick Saban said about going forward with the Power Five, that we in the SEC should only be playing other Power Five teams in our non-conference schedule. I think the fans would like it, and I think uh, the argument that they play no one, that everyone loves to bring up on teams that now they're going to, instead of the final two, it's going to be a final four, I think that'll help that. And that'll bring ticket sales, that'll bring the money, because we have so many games that – Florida's will play the Georgia Southerners, despite the fact they lost. Right, right. And uh, Ole Miss, for instance, starts the year with Louisiana Lafayette, who's a really good Sun Belt team. But you don't look at that schedule, and the fans don't go, "Oh yeah, I'm really excited to go to this Ole Miss Louisiana Lafayette game." If you're playing other Power Five teams, even if the team's not that great, I know I've, uh, as an Iowa Hawkeye fan, you look at the schedule and I see Pitt and Arizona State. You don't know how good those teams are, but those are exciting games. Those teams might be good in their conference. And that's where I think Nick Saban's coming from. It's going to really help from a money standpoint. And as from we, what we know is going on with college football, if a coach comes up with an idea that's going to help drive sales, I think mm-hmm. that's going to work for everyone. All right, let's make some picks on the SEC. Matt, uh, who wins the East and West, and who ends up winning it all in Atlanta? I'm going with Steve Spurrier in South Carolina out of the East and the West. I think it's a toss-up right now because I just I don't know anything about Alabama's quarterback. I have faith, though, in Nick Saban, what he can do. Nick Marshall, Auburn, though, I really like them, too. That one, to me, is kind of a toss-up. Can I get back to you in, like, three months? <laughs> <laughs> no. Pick somebody. Give me Alabama, then. <laughs> Alabama to win it all, too? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you just you got to go with Saban, right? Fish? I'll take Georgia in the East. Been wrong before uh, with that pack. Georgia and East. That like. I have Georgia beating South Carolina, so I have Georgia uh, mm-hmm. in the East. Uh, I have Alabama in the West. I, I just think they have time these first four games to figure out the quarterback mm-hmm. situation. And, and everywhere else, they have talent. And they got such studs in the backfield, such studs at wide receiver that they'll be okay. So I, I like Alabama. I like Georgia. Take Alabama to, to win the championship. All right, Ari. I like Alabama in the, the West. That's the easier pick. In the East, I don't, I don't necessarily think anyone really stands out to me, but I'm going to have to agree with Stark and go with, uh, with South Carolina. I think Alabama is going to run over South Carolina in the championship game. It, it's so funny, and I'll get to my picks in our overtime segment, but are, are we downplaying Auburn after what they just did? Yes. And, yeah, and things so have probably. been quiet, yeah. too, yeah. which is scary. Right. <laughs> because, I mean, everything that's happened in the offseason, Auburn, the biggest thing was the Nick Marshall thing. So he's not going to play a little bit of the yeah, game right. against Arkansas on Saturday. But everything else, you haven't really heard a lot from Auburn, and that's kind of frightening. All right, first year for the playoff in Division One A football. I'm going to get your picks on that in a second as well. But how confident, let me start with you, Matt, are you in this committee? Doing the right thing, making the right picks, getting the right information? It's year one. I think there's going to be mistakes. I think there's going to be a lot of barroom debates then and, you know, open to interpretation of how could they overlook this guy or that guy. When you're talking about trying to whittle it all down to four teams, there's going to be teams at five, six, seven, eight. They're thinking, I should have been in there. So there's going to be problems. Hopefully, I'm, I'm hopeful that they can figure it out going forward, but I think we're in for a bumpy road at least for the first year as they try and navigate these uncharted waters and figure out where we are. Do they have the right people on the committee? I don't think it matters. I think it's going to be a disaster. Uh, wow. And, and I do. I, I mean, every commissioner of every conference during media day said our champion should be in that 14th yep. playoff. One of them's going to be out. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's known. Now, if two teams come from one conference mm-hmm. and two of those conferences are out, there's going to be a problem. And, and I think selecting the teams, I mean, Bill Hancock tried to explain it at SEC media days and confused himself mm-hmm. more, more than he did everybody <laughs> else in attendance. So, I don't know if they really know how it's going to work out, how they're going to pick these teams. Let's be honest. that You can't watch every team every single week. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think this first year will be a disaster. These are human beings for goodness sakes. They have different thoughts and different feelings. 
Ari, I believe, this is just my opinion, you tell me if you agree or disagree, that they're going to bend over backwards not to put two teams in from one conference, which will hurt the SEC, at least in this initial year. I don't think they want to go out there and throw two SEC teams and be called homers or favoring this conference. What do you think? I don't know that uh, that it matters based on what will happen during the season. What if two SEC teams, and now it's happened in the past three or four years, are two of the three best teams in the country? Because out of those Power Five conferences, the Big Ten just lost arguably the best player in the conference, so you don't know who, what's going to happen in the Big Ten. The Big 12 hasn't been able to play defense since I was born, so they – you don't know who's going to come out of that conference. You have two really good, te- two three really good teams in the Pac-12. You have Florida State's dominant in the ACC, and then it's just a bunch of really good SEC teams as as, uh, as far as you look at the coaches poll and the AP poll. I think that's what it tells you. I think they're going to try. I agree with you not to put two SEC teams in, but I think it ends up happening anyway. All right, let's make our picks for the first ever playoff. Obviously, there's a lot of things that'll come into play, including injuries. Um, let me start with you, Matt. I'm sitting down there next time because I have to go first every single time. But I'll go with Florida State. I think that they'll have an easy road. I think, yeah, because Ohio State losing Braxton Miller, I'd like Michigan State then out of the Big Ten, I guess. Uh, I'm going to stick with Alabama. Why not? And then I'd like UCLA. I think they're going to be really good out west. Between them and Oregon, I suppose. But if I had to pick one and you're making me, I'll take UCLA. We are very, very similar. Fish? I, I like Alabama, Florida State as well. I like Michigan State. Uh, out of the Big Ten, and my fourth team is Oklahoma. Ari? Oklahoma, interesting. I like I like Oklahoma in the Big 12, but I don't like the rest of the Big 12. So I'm going to go with Florida State. I think it's going to have an easy road. I agree with Matt. I think Oregon is going to be the good team, the best team to come out of the West. And I think Alabama gets in, and then LSU sneaks in. Ooh. I know they're going to have some trouble early in the year with the quarterback, but that team is so talented elsewhere, and they have Leonard Fournette as run, running back. I think they're just going to use that Alabama – blueprint good defense run the ball hope something good happens I'm so curious to see how they're going to deal with the big 12 because they don't have a championship game if it's going to be beneficial or if it's going to be a detriment Mm -hmm. when it's all said and done because that could determine whether or not the big 12 adds teams in the end if they are left out this year which could help schools like maybe Memphis who knows down the road but that's a long way off all right final minute Heisman who's the favorite Fish. I'll start with fish. (laughs) We're less than a minute. It's going to steal yours. Um, Marcus Mariota. From Oregon? Marcus Mariota. Would you you have said Braxton Miller if he was healthy? No, I don't don't like Braxton Miller, actually. I would not have gotten with Braxton Miller. Okay, so two for Marcus. I'll go with the reigning Heisman winner, assuming he doesn't get arrested or charged with anything between now and the end of the season. Why not? Jameis Winston. Only once it's happened where it's been back-to-back. So let's make some history, yeah. Archie Griffin at Ohio State. Matt Stark from Fox 13, thanks so much for joining us. Really Cheers. appreciate it. <laughs> Rob Fisher from Real Sports Talk, Sports 56, 87, 7 FM. Of course, the Grizzlies sideline reporter as well on TV. Thank you. Absolutely. Anything. Ari Alexander from WMC News uh, Channel 5. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Greg. We appreciate it. Great stuff, guys. Starts tonight, folks, with Ole Miss, Boise State, South Carolina, Texas A&M. Let the games begin. Coming up, overtime in my picks. Okay, now that we've heard from the panel, let me give you my two cents, starting with the Memphis Tigers. I have the Tigers winning their season opener against Austin P, then losing at nationally ranked UCLA. After a bye week, the Tigers return home for a pivotal early season game with Middle Tennessee State, and the Tigers will extract some revenge from the Blue Raiders for what happened last season and get the W. The Tigers will close out the month 2-2 two and two after falling at Ole Miss, another ranked squad. I see the Tigers splitting their first two conference games with a loss at Cincinnati on October 4th and a win over dangerous Houston on the 11th. After another bye week, the Tigers go to SMU and get beat, but bounce back to stop Tulsa on Halloween night. Four games in November will make or break the season. I think all four games are winnable, but we know what happened at the end of last season. I think it's a loss at Temple, a win at Tulane, a win at home versus USF, and a loss at home to UConn. That has the Tigers 6-6 six and six and in a bowl game. Perhaps wishful thinking on my part. As for the SEC, I'll spare you the game-by-game analysis and tell you I think Alabama bounces back to win the West 
with a 7-1 mark and an overall 11-win regular season. Defending SEC champion Auburn, LSU, and Ole Miss all finished tied for second with 5-3 league marks. Then Texas A&M and Mississippi State at 4-4 in the league, Arkansas at 1-7. Six of the seven teams from the West will win eight or more overall games. In the East, I have South Carolina and Georgia on top at 6-2 in the league, but the Gamecocks get the nod by virtue of a head-to-head -head win over the Dogs. They are followed by Florida at 5-3. Defending East champion Mizzou goes 4-4 four four in the league, good enough for fourth. Tennessee at 5-7 and 2-6 and and in the league come up a little short for bowl qualification. Then it's Vandy and Kentucky both at 1-7 and seven in the SEC, a huge drop-off for the Commodores from a season ago. But what do I know? And that'll do it for the show. Remember, you can see any of our past programs by simply heading to our website at WKNO.org and clicking on KNO Tonight. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The Lighting Source, major line distributor of commercial and industrial lighting, including hard-to-find bulbs and fixtures, as well as a broad range of LED products. With 35 years' experience servicing lighting needs, The Lighting Source proudly sponsors Sports Files.